Ancient civilizations were well aware of the various regularities in the positions of the planets, stars, the sun and the moon on a range of different timescales. For example, detailed observations showed that the moon repeated its cycle of phases every 29.5 days and that the seasons were related to the length of the day and the height of the sun in the sky. For example, the flood of the Nile, uh, the River Nile, was very important to ancient Egyptians because water, mud and silt were washed up onto the banks, making fertile growing areas. As soon as the floods receded, the Egyptians ploughed the soil, sowed their seeds and used animals to push them into the ground. The Egyptians used the time at which the bright star Sirius rose after sunset to predict when the Nile would flood. Astronomy was therefore born out of the basic need for human survival when to sow and harvest crops, pick fruits and nuts, and hunt for antelope and buffalo. The celestial calendars were key to the ancients' very existence. As ancient civilizations flourished, stone monuments and temples were built to act as ceremonial and or religious observatories. Many were aligned to the positions of key stars, for example the three stars in Orion's belt, or to the rising of the sun on key dates of the year, for example, the summer solstice. I mean, Stonehenge is one of the most famous and important stone circles in Britain, of course, and it was built in stages between 3000 and 1500 BC. And its purpose, although remaining a mystery, um, could have been an astro astronomical observatory, a place of healing and a site of funerals and religious ceremonies, and they've all been suggested, of course. However, the current celestial alignments of many ancient monuments differ from their original alignments because the Earth's axis of rotation is not fixed, but traces out a circular path against the stars. So this relatively slow gyroscopic wobbling of the Earth's axis is called precession, and it arises from the gravitational pull of the Moon and the Sun on the Earth's equatorial bulge. One complete rotation of the Earth's axis takes about 26,000 years. Now, as the Earth's axis processes, different stars can be found at the celestial north pole. We've come into Polaris pretty much perfectly at the moment, okay? Um, but um, previously, it would have been um, um, Thuban, um, just after about 400, uh, 4,000, sorry, uh, BC, something like that. Early models of the solar system, okay? So early models of the universe were based on the geocentric or earth-centered systems of ancient Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle. The Aristotelian universe was based on four elements, earth, air, fire and water, and a system of concentric crystalline spheres driven by a prime mover that carried the moon, sun, planets and fixed stars around the earth. Uh, here's a, a 17th century print of the Aristotelian universe in the sublunar sphere, the four elements were changeable, temporary and corruptible, but in the superlunar sphere, heavens, everything was changeless, pure and perfect. Uh, one of the major problems with this model was the inability to explain the observed retrograde motion of the planets. In a modification, each planet was placed on a small rotating circle, an epicycle, whose centre revolved around the Earth on different circles. The deferent. So please look at these uh, two pictures of the oh, just presented for you now. So in this Greek model, the planets revolved on epicycles whose centres revolved around the Earth. Okay. Uh, Ptolemy made subtle modifications to the Greek model that closely matched the observed motion of the planets. These refinements were still unable to explain the exact positions and changing speeds and directions of the planets and required further modification by the Egyptian astronomer and geographer uh, Claudius Ptolemaeus, or Ptolemy. Um, now, Ptolemy retained the epicycles, but making two additional small adjustments that involved a slightly off-centred Earth and an imaginary point called the equant, from which the angular motion of the centre of each epicycle was uniform, a little complicated, you might think. And in fact, Alfonso X of Castile, the Spanish, who was an astronomer as well as the Spanish king, he said, if the Lord Almighty had consulted me before embarking upon his creation, 
I should have recommended something much simpler. Well, uh, Ptolemy's model, however, gained general acceptance for almost 1,500 years until the Polish monk, Nicholas Copernicus, applied some mathematical modelling to the problem and advocated a heliocentric universe. Now, Copernicus was not the first to propose such a model. Aristarchus of Samos, of whom we will learn more later, argued for a heliocentric universe as far back as 270 BC. Uh, based on his calculations that the sun was much larger than the earth. But unlike previous schemes, a model with the sun at its centre could explain the observed motion of the planets without the need for the equant and epicycles. Um, now, uh, if you're interested about Copernicus, he published his book uh, in 1543, and it's called De Revolutionibus Orbium Caelestium. Okay. Copernicus was reluctant to present his model um, to the world. Some say that he did not wish to place himself in conflict with the church, and others say that it was for fear of being ridiculed and hissed off the stage by his peers. But in 1543, as he lay dying, Copernicus finally published his book, and uh, it was called in English, On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. The heliocentric model was gaining acceptance in the late 16th century, but astronomers were keen to reduce the disagreement between the predicted by mathematics positions and true observed positions of the planets. Um, so I, I will carry on with this story, but I thought it might be interesting for you to see a few uh, pictures of some of the more famous um, uh, people who are involved in this uh, the development. So here is a portrait of Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe uh, by the artist uh, Tobias Gempelin, if you're interested in that. Of course, you know him because of the huge crater on the moon. Uh, in the middle, we've got this uh, drawing of Uraniborg, Tycho's castle, in which he housed his many observational instruments. And lastly, of course, we've had this picture before, I think, Kepler, who became Tycho's assistant in Prague in 1600. The most uh, prominent astronomer in this area was the eccentric Tycho Brahe, who, under the patronage of Frederick II, the King of Denmark, built the Uraniborg Observatory on the island of Hven that lay between Denmark and Sweden. Tycho was particularly interested in the motion of the planet Mars and plotted its position systematically and with great precision for over 20 years. In 1600, Tycho was joined by a German mathematician called Kepler, who became his assistant. In 1601, Tycho died suddenly, and some sources tell us that it was due to a bladder infection acquired through excessive drinking, but others suggest that Tycho died through mercury poisoning. Kepler was now free to analyse Tycho's positional, uh, positional data for Mars and formulated his three laws of planetary motion, which he published in Astronomia Nova, the new astronomy, in 1609, and Harmonices Mundi, the harmony of the world, in 1619. Okay, so 1609 was also the year in which Italian man mathematician and astronomer Galileo Galilei used his optic tube telescope to observe the skies and make sketches of what he saw. Two of Galileo's observations in particular gave him firm support to the heliocentric universe and helped to establish its acceptance. And that, of course, is the apparent size of planet Venus changed and showed phases, and other evidence was the four moons, Galileo called them satellites, orbited um, the planets Jupiter. 